Okay, so now professionals here are going to be introducing themselves, then you can ask questions to one or more and they'll be answering, okay? Let us begin. Hello, I'm Christian Perron, Professor of Infectious and Tropical Diseases in Paris. <clears throat> During 26 years, I was the head of the universe, uh, Department of Medicine in a university hospital. And also during 15 years, I was uh, president of many com official commissions to manage with the governments, uh, epidemics, health crises, vaccination. And I, I, I was also during several years vice president of the European Committee for Vaccinations at the World Health Organization. So since the very beginning of the, this pandemic, I spoke in all the media. At that time, I, uh, they liked me. I was invited everywhere. But uh, a few months later, uh, uh, I was fired from the media, fired from my position in the hospital. Uh, I became a charlatan, officially. <laughs> but I continued my fight, and I, I wrote three books about the crisis, and uh, I'm still alive. That's nice. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Arne Burkhardt. I'm from Germany, uh, Reutlingen. I'm a pathologist with uh, 50 years of uh, diagnostic experience. Uh, we in Reutlingen uh, re evaluated 75 autopsies of uh, deceased in timely connection with the vaccination. And uh, by now uh, we have 50 surgical specimens and uh, biopsies from patients with severe adverse effects. And we discovered a, a number of uh, new disease entities or tissular and cellular changes that have not been seen before in this combination. And uh, in our uh, uh, evaluation, we think that uh, these changes uh, contributed to the deaths uh, in 80% of uh, the patients that we uh, uh, saw in the uh, autopsy and histological examination. Thank you. Look, when doing those autopsies, did you look at the presence of, look for the presence of spike protein? Uh, we uh, uh, apparently we, are, we were not dealing with a toxin that comes from the outside, uh, supplied from the outside. So examination of the contents of the stomach or the blood uh, would not be sufficient. So the toxin actually is uh, fabricated in the organs, in the cells. So we had to look into the cells and this was one of our first steps that we developed an immunohistochemical method of demonstrating the spike protein S1 in the tissues. And uh, we found it uh, very um, distinctly in the lesions that we observed. So uh, we think this is uh, 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 some kind of uh, not uh, absolutely uh, uh, certain, but, but it is a strong evidence. What was the longest time point from when somebody had received one of the shots to still finding the spike protein? In other words, how long does it last in the body? Well, we, we could uh, uh, demonstrate it uh, 120 days after the death. Uh, after, uh, excuse me, after the application, yes. Doctor, your results uh, appear to imply that there is an equilibrium between bound spike in various tissue compartments and circulating spike in various uh, blood compartments. We have data from various sources on measurement of the presence of the spike protein in body in circulating blood. Um, your data would suggest that that is a underestimate of of the um, total amount of spike protein produced from these vaccines because of the equilibrium between tissue binding and blood. Do I understand that correctly? Yes, I would agree. This is uh, probably an uh, underestimation, yes. Okay, but uh, the real problem is uh, another. The problem is what is the cutoff on which we must take in charge of the patient that can be a risk of develop an intracoagulation disseminated program, no syndrome, etc. This is important from the clinical point of view. So in the laboratory, you can do what you want. You can show what you want. But after, if we detect something into the blood sample, 
is uh, in terms of pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetics, etc., is important from the clinical point of view or not. If I found the spike protein into the milk of a woman who had COVID, who had vaccine, etc., this is consistent for the health of the children, of the boy, of the newborn. This is very important. And the companies never give this information on pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic. This was necessary to do that because it's in the global good rules to manufacturing a product for that. If we don't have that, this is totally unknown. Even if we can know experimentally in many, in many countries, many laboratories, but on the clinical point of view, we want to know what is a cutoff. Because also the European Commission put a cutoff on the toxic substances. How we can put a cutoff on spike, on synthetic spike protein? And there are two types of protein, too, that are completely different, are not the same. We don't confuse the thing. Yes. Laboratory is one thing. Human people are other things because we have the need to implement the clinical activity. What we can do on this patient? Today, when a patient will arrive, he asks how we can liberate myself with my spike protein if the spike protein is toxic. What I can do? I cannot measure anything, or I can measure some things that is uh, some phantom. Okay, so with other vaccines, you often do inject toxic substances such as botulinum toxoid or tetanus toxoid, but you can measure the amount that you are injecting, and therefore you can have um, a level below which you know it's relatively safe. But in this case, you cannot because your cells are making the product, and nobody knows how much you're going to make. So I would submit there's there is no safe level for an RNA. Uh, produced spike protein and that none of them should be made. Yes. And just to add a point, I know from uh, many physicians that they, they, on a lot of patients, we made the dosage of D-dimers and it's a marker of the capacity to, to have a higher risk of thrombosis. So a physician could make his dosage and give um, a small dose of aspirin or a um, product to prevent uh, thrombosis. It may be efficient to prevent a cardiac infarction or, a, or stroke. I'd like to ask Dr. Burkhardt if you have any information from your autopsy studies on whether the um, severity of the, uh, of the risk of death is related to the level of vitamin D and whether there's any autopsy studies on D levels in post-mortem blood between pe people who've clearly died from, from the vaccine uh, or COVID or both, uh, and those who haven't. The, uh, because this, uh, it, it seems obvious to me that there's a bit of, the, there's a, seems to be a bit of neglect of natural immunity and boosting natural immunity. And the obvious fact, which uh, I've discussed extensively in my book and in a talk the other day, that, um, Every time you're vaccinated, every time your system is stimulated, your natural immunity has to fall. And the, these spikes have been, these proteins, toxins, have been designed with this in mind, I'm sure. But there is a way we can pose it. I wonder whether you think there's any autopsy studies that could be done, uh, really, with, uh, to, to, to look at this question. Well, actually, unfortunately, the information about the patient is very limited. And uh, as I said yesterday, about 80% of them are dying at home and have not been in the hospital before. So this is uh, what we call now sudden adult death syndrome. And uh, so, uh, actually, this is a very interesting question, but I cannot answer it. Sorry. Yeah, I've got a question for uh, Dr. Phillips. So. Um, there's a lot of people suffering and have been suffering over the past couple of years. Um, and we've seen like an epic rise in the number of suicides, for example. So um, what kind of suggestions do you have for people, you know, around the world to deal with the suffering that they're experiencing right now? Yeah, that's a, well, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big, <laughs> big question to answer. Um, but uh, often our focus uh, when we're in a crisis, when we're going through tyranny or even a medical illness or, or anything is often uh, trying to fix the problem. And, um, and often that can create more problems in the process. Uh, if you're always focusing on 
uh, problems in the external world, um, sometimes you're just running in this endless loop and nothing really seems to satisfy, or sometimes it makes things worse. And I've certainly experienced that much in, in my uh, ordeal uh, with losing my license. But um, I think, uh, to summarize, I guess in, in some ways, uh, if you think of it, uh, just one adage is that hurt people hurt people, yeah. but well people, and, and when, when you can go inward, right, find that peace within yourself, that is really powerful because it's contagious as well. And it's something that can really allow you to heal not only yourself, but, but the world. And, and so as much as it's painful, it's actually really painful to do. Uh, when you look at your suffering, the urge is to go outward, of being like, this person has harmed me, that government has done all these evil things, they're the awful ones. But when you really sit with it, in a meditative practice um, and go inward to yourself and, and kind of bring everything within, it's painful. Uh, but as you, if, as you sit with it, it actually begins to dissolve and, uh, and what changes is actually your, your view of yourself and your world. It transforms in that experience and, uh, and that's where you can actually find peace and, and that's from that space, I think, is where you can create really uh, powerful solutions um, to people, patients, uh, or really in the world. Um, but when you're in that frantic state of, of suffering, of blame, of, um, of trying to fix, um, often it's not a productive place to, to find solutions. So I encourage everybody who is suffering, because uh, really it's a part of the human experience, to, to go inward. Uh, find that inner peace, because I really think that's where uh, we can find solutions also for the world. I have a question for Renate Holzeisen. On the way to the Human Rights Court, how many steps we made and, I mean, do you have any hope to our pronunciation, a good pronunciation? We have to decide between um, we have uh, we have the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, and we have the uh, European Court of Justice. Hmm? Um, the European Court uh, for Human uh, Rights in Strasbourg, unfortunately, has 18 judges, which were put there by Soros and his organizations and we have uh, uh, there was a report uh, published I think 10 uh, days ago uh, um, by an international organization I can't remember now the name which uh, explains in a very exactly and documented way why these judges um, have some uh, real problem they can't be uh, they shouldn't be there Yes, they have a great conflict of interest. So, therefore, um, my uh, trust in the European Court of Human Rights is zero. That's our great problem because obviously the European Court of Human Rights should be that court uh, which should, um, yes, defend us. And, and, and therefore that way, uh, in my opinion, is not the right, will not be the right way. Then we have the European Court of Justice. And, and, the, um, and we have also the, Euro we have the European Court, which is the first instance, and then the European Court of Justice, the second and last instance, uh, which are the two courts, the two courts which uh, should uh, as defend against the violation of European Union law. And as you know, um, these uh, so-called COVID-19 vaccines were authorized in a centralized way by the European uh, Commission uh, on the basis of European Union medicinal law. So uh, obviously it should be the European Court or the European Court of Justice to look into and to decide if these authorizations are legal or illegal. We have in the European Union a great problem that the European Court of Justice, the judges, 
uh, in decades of jurisdiction um, restricted uh, and restricted um, more and more the legitimacy of the single uh, citizen to bring uh, directly actions uh, before the European Court uh, asking the European judges to um, prove the legality of the actions of the European Union organs and in the case that they I think that they are illegal to annul them. Um, we are in this now, I think we are now in this uh, dramatic, in a, a dramatic situation which shows also that the system of the European Union jurisdiction doesn't operate. We had, uh, I think, the best uh, advocate general on the European Court of Justice, which was Sir Francis Jacobs, which already in uh, 25 years ago pointed out that problem because he said you can't with only an interpretation because you have to know that the law foresees the right for the single citizen to ask Obviously, the court, uh, which is competent to uh, to decide to interpret, uh, to 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 decide if uh, an, an action of a European Union organ is uh, legal or illegal from that uh, point uh, of um, uh, law view. And but the European Court of Justice, as the European Union grow and grow and, and more and more uh, member states came in, they, uh, mm, their fear was that there were, uh, would be an overloading of, of actions for annulment and therefore they said hmm, only on the very, very uh, stringent conditions you are allowed to go there and ask them to, uh, to annul directly uh, illegal actions. So, uh, in this case, in this case um, of these uh, decisions of the European <coughs> Commission regarding first the conditional authorization and now even the non-conditional five years valid uh, authorization of these so-called mRNA vaccines, uh, my opinion is that we are, uh, these are um, so-called regulatory acts and therefore we now filed in the European Court, which is the first instance, these two, uh, uh, two actions for annulment, asking the European Court, uh, which is competent to, to, uh, uh, to see, to prove if uh, if um, uh, the, the, this authorization were uh, illegal or not, we ask them to annul them because the violation uh, by the EMA and by the European Commission of European Union law is brutal. They violated every principle which the European legislator fixed in our European Union medicinal law. And as the violation is so huge, so incredible huge, huge, you, you just have to think about the fact that they even declare that the producers fulfilled the conditions uh, imposed uh, in the uh, conditional authorization of the substances, which means uh, to do clinical studies, yes, to prove efficacy and safety. And we know that the producers cancelled the control group by offering the uh, so called vaccination, and therefore, efficacy and safety never have been uh, uh, proven. Um, so, uh, and we have the situation that the uh, European Commission, in the decision for the no more conditional authorization, now valid for five years, declares that the producers have fulfilled all conditions imposed in the conditional authorization. This is a huge lie. So, um, we now are battling 
to have uh, um, recognized our legitimacy to ask the European Court to uh, annul this authorization. And we will go also uh, to the uh, second instance to the European Court of Justice. And as we, uh, um, as we have also to put under pressure the national judges of all European member states uh, who um, accept uh, only a few, um, if you don't uh, do their work, and uh, because if they would do the work, they send it already to the European Court of Justice, the question regarding the, um, um, this, this uh, authorizations. So we now, as Children's uh, House Defense Europe, have published yesterday the actions for annulment in English, then we will publish them in German, in Italy, in other Spanish, in, in French, in all, in all the languages of the European Union member states, most important, in order that judges, but each citizen can, um, can go there, read, because it's, it, it is, it is uh, written in a way that each person understands what huge uh, um, uh, violation of law was done in order that we can also in this way create this um, important necessary uh, pressure in order that we can come to annulment of this uh, crime of hum um, a crime against humanity it is on, it's, it's our only possibility to work in this way. I, I just, want to, just wanted to add a comment about justice in France. With France, we created an association, Bon Sens, Common Sense. We filed uh, more than 60 complaints in justice, including the Conseil d'État, Conseil Constitutionnel, like the Supreme Court. All were rejected, and all what was illegal was considered legal by the Supreme Court. So, the same thing. Supreme Court of Justice of Europe. I want to spin off what this was week. just said because it's really important for people to know the litigators uh, on the subject. Me and Maria, we're going to talk about this. I'll just make it quick. There's contamination in the products, and if you want some proof positive of something that you can use to actually nail these guys, the plasmids that were actually released by Pfizer are very different from the plasmids that have actually been discovered recently by Kevin McClellan. There's an SV40 promoter in the Moderna and Pfizer products, and there's a CMV promoter in the Janssen products. The one that they disclosed shows only a T7 promoter. It's not supposed to be that way. So this, this is hard evidence you can get them on. Yeah. That's all I want to say. Yes, and the follow-up what she said, the EMA on the conditional authorization put five uh, specific obligations, four are for manufacturing, and everyone should know that the reason why we have a regulator in the beginning is not for safety and efficacy, okay? Yes. The first thing was for adulteration manufacturing. Yes. So we haven't even met our first criteria of why we have a regulator. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have the next panel come up, please. My name is Jason Kristoff. I run uh, International Psychological Reprogramming Institute, where we use mind control to get people's lives back on track. Rosanna Kiefer, neurologist, PhD, uh, scientific director of Hippocrates Org. I um, showed the damage uh, of neurological damage related directly to the vaccine, and I will find some cure that can uh, help uh, significantly to improve the patients. I'm Katarina Lindley. I'm a Croatian-born and American-trained family physician. I'm a president of the Texas American College of American uh, American College of uh, Physicians and Surgeons, and also part of the Global COVID Summit. And I've been treating patients from the beginning. And because of my experience living in communism, I speak about freedom and totalitarianism. I'm Dr. Harvey Risch. I'm a professor, now emeritus, of epidemiology at Yale School of Public Health. Uh, after medical school, I went and got a, a PhD in mathematical modeling of infectious epidemics. And then I had a 30-plus year career 
in teaching epidemiology to introductory, intermediate, advanced epidemiologic methods to PhD students at the University of Toronto and then Yale. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I was tasked by the Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering, of which I'm a member, to look at early treatments for COVID. And, my, and I spent time uh, looking at all of the work on, on hydroxychloroquine, wrote what's basically the seminal paper on the efficacy and safety of hydroxychloroquine that was published in the American Journal of Epidemiology in, in May of 2020. Uh, published a few op-eds at, at that time in Newsweek and elsewhere, got taken to task on CNN, which I'm still proud of, um, <laughs> and uh, pushed back uh, on that, and uh, have continued to uh, look at, aside from substantiating what I said in May of 2020 about the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine, which all subsequent studies have shown its benefit in protection against mortality and hospitalization, that uh, everything related to what's befallen us by the free will of immoral people, who evil people, who uh, push the agendas that are not public health and that are not medicine. So that's been the fight that, that I've been in. Good morning, I'm Nick Hudson. By day, I'm a private equity investor in Cape Town, South Africa, and by night, I run an organization called Pandata, affectionately known as Panda, which was formed at the very beginning of the COVID policy response as one of the first advocacy organizations in the world. And we got quick results, notably, I think we were the first people to analyze the efficacy of lockdowns, showing that they were not being effective in reducing COVID mortality in light of the international data. And the organization subsequently grew way outside of its South African borders. Our research program is now quite diverse. We are increasingly moving into the political and economic and financial domains to understand the COVID phenomenon as a political, not a medical phenomenon but we are still engaged quite heavily in one particular project on the medical front, which is to elucidate the extent to which the, the excess mortality that was observed in certain countries around the world, not all, was the result of iatrogenic impact, uh, broadly read as the policy response, not specifically doctors and hospitals necessarily. And then on the political front, we have an extensive uh, set of projects that are seeking to uh, make some headway on the question of to what extent this whole policy response was a manifestation of planning of an emergent event in the context of complex social phenomena or a mess up. And the point we like to make is that it very clearly is all three people who take the extreme position of it's all planned are in, like, in all likelihood wrong. People who say that there was no planning and that there was just an emergent event are also in all likelihood wrong. There's a very complex interplay between institutions and long-standing perspectives, ideologies, uh, worldviews, social and cultural phenomena that come to bear on this situation. And we think it's incredibly important prospectively that research energy is directed into that domain it's very hard for us to make headway if we don't make progress there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Pierre Corey. I'm an internist, a pulmonologist, and an ICU specialist. And um, I'm the co-founder of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, which is an organization that has sought to develop uh, what we think are the most effective treatment protocols for all the phases of COVID, including vaccine injury and long-haul COVID. Hi, I'm Dr. Ryan Cole. I'm a board-certified anatomic and clinical pathologist. Uh, run a, an independent medical laboratory called Diagnostics. I'm also a member of the Global COVID Summit, a strong ally of the FLCCC, and I've been trying to document the tissue damages uh, related to COVID and the uh, experimental injections in the human body. Since the microphone is here, um, so I have a question to Dr. Cole related to the relation to, with uh, the injections and cancer. So last year it was published that uh, spike uh, binds uh, with a, quite a high affinity to estrogen receptor alpha, which was published in, uh, I think it was collaboration between Italian and American uh, scientists, was published in Scientist Fault. So 
Um, and uh, the author showed that spy could bind estrogen alpha, but also modify its function. So my question is whether you think this could be uh, impact, this could impact um, cancers or cancers which express the estrogen alpha receptors, such as breast cancer, ovarian cancers. And then the second question is, uh, do you look for that? Do you test, do you stain for estrogen alpha, maybe intercellular localization, expression, uh, things like that in your pathology uh, samples? That's a great question. And we know um, a lot of tumors are estrogen driven. We know the spike protein binds uh, estrogen alpha. I've looked at some of the tumors with estrogen progesterone markers. We also know the S2 subunit will bind uh, P53 as well as the uh, BRCA genes. So in some of the studies we've done in the laboratory with some of the cancers, we look at uh, co-binding, co-expression, P53, estrogen, progesterone, binding of spike, and then also using uh, controls to make sure, make sure it's not viral. We also look at nucleocapsid and membrane. So the short answer is yes, and we know that with that strong binding to those receptors, it can drive cancer pathways. So I think there's a lot more studies to be done, a lot more tumors to be examined K-series-wise, but I think we're unfortunately going to find that the spike protein is absolutely a uh, cancer driver carcinogenic, yes. My question is for the non-clinicians on the panel, and that is we heard at yesterday's presentations in the European Parliament that the pandemic could be understood as a tool to enforce um, control through vaccinations and vaccine passports. My question is, what about further violations in other areas going forward? Are we next likely to see, for example, a central bank digital currency or climate restrictions used to diminish human liberties? I'm going to take the aspect of central bank digital currencies first. There are a couple of things worth noting in the same way that lockdowns emerged in lockstep around the world. Digital bank central currencies are coming at us in an unbelievably coordinated fashion. It's, this is not accident. You don't get, what is it, 200 odd countries around the world embarking within the space of a couple of months on uh, pilot studies or, or actual uh, 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 implementations um, by, after a process of independent review by their parliaments deciding that this is the best thing and, and that's necessary conditions in the country have changed, we've been looking at it for years, no. There's a coordinated rollout here as there was with lockdown. And it's not, this is not, that's not an emergent event. Um, whether the, there's a, a, a real risk here or not uh, depends quite a bit on exactly what we imagine the risks to be. There can be quite straightforward um, mess-ups in the sense that if the currencies are programmable, you end the fungibility of money. One unit of money that's denominated under some central bank's digital currency platform may not be worth the same as the next unit because it has different program attached to it. And that violates one of the fundamental principles of money, which could result in the whole project being complete failures. And there hasn't been a successful implementation of a central bank digital currency, they've all had immense problems. So what are we facing? There will probably be implementation at a small level, here and there, with greater or lesser success. And um, there is some threat involved here. If that attaches to certain categories of transaction, and it becomes difficult to transact in, um, in, in those categories outside of the central bank currency, then it could indeed be used as a tool of control, and I think it's a very valid concern that needs to be understood. What most people are doing at the moment is completely over, oversimplifying the threat and not understanding the nuance. Um, very interesting discussion on this the other day. We had in the Twitter spaces, the recordings available. We had some of the top experts in the world considering this and going through that nuance. And I would, under, I would encourage everybody to look at that very closely before jumping to conclusions as to what the risk will be. With respect to your overall question, is there a control agenda clearly? Yeah, so this is a, a bit of a generic question to the entire panel. Um, but very briefly, I'm wondering if everybody can give me, uh, from your perspective and the perspective especially of your presentations, what's one solution, I guess in 30 seconds to a minute, um, that you see that we can solve some of the problems that we've seen through this pandemic and, and prevent or prevent uh, a future uh, response like we've seen over the last three years? Uh, one very simple solution is 
We've lost common sense, but we've also lost common science. Funding needs to go back to real science from all the large federal institutions in all the nations and actually research things before we experiment on human beings. I know the lab rats were very frustrated and that's why they wanted humans to be the first experimental <laughs> subjects. But if we get back to common principles, I think that's one solution so that we don't harm people. We have to acknowledge people have been vaccine injured, vaccine harmed worldwide. We need to focus funding on helping those individuals and never allow this to happen again. Um, a couple of thoughts on that. You know, clearly science has to be cleaned up. I don't know that the scientists are going to do that, right? I think it's going to come from the people. Uh, generally, my solutions are education. I just keep thinking that if more people are aware of what's really going on, the truth about things, um, some of that change can be affected. Uh, in particular, and I don't want to get too granular, but um, one of the, the great sadnesses that I learned in COVID is how little the average doctor understands how corrupt the journals are and how captured they are. And I think if you have an entire globe of physicians working in that system, being misled by a corrupted uh, source of education information, you're going to get things that have, like, have happened in the last three years. And I think that that knowledge has to get out. And uh, this is really a joke I'm not promoting, but read my book. It is a case study in exactly what I'm talking about. And, you know, as someone who's lived in a classroom and taught at the bedside for a couple of decades, I, I really want my former students, my colleagues, and the average person to really learn how they did what they did and so that hopefully we can, we can prevent this from happening in the future. I think uh, the hardest task for us is to wake up the people because a large part is just uh, continue to sleep and but I am optimist because if we keep going to inform, uh, to provide uh, rational data and showing that we always uh, agree and we help people endure it, uh, I think that we could um, uh, get the critical mass because a critical mass that is aware is fundamental because they can, the critical mass can condition political choice. And uh, that's now our job, job is, uh, is to inform people. In all mind control experiments, the less healthy someone is, the more they're placed easier under mind control. Something you can do at home, start being healthy. Moral, morality, ethics, and justice only are manufactured in the prefrontal cortex just behind your forehead. You do not have access to those if you're unhealthy. That's why I, I dedicate myself, no alcohol, no caffeine, uh, all organic food, clean water all the time. This is something the average person can start. If they're, they're looking, they're feeling overwhelmed, start with your own health. And it can really vibrate out of you. You can affect a lot more people than you would ever expect just by being healthy. And with that, you, you have the strength, and you're going to be least likely to be mind-controlled and manipulated and brainwashed. And that's where the awakening comes in, where we start using our no instead of giving our yes because we feel weak. And this weakness can come about simply by being unhealthy. And this is why the groups that are doing this to us today have taken the last 40 or 50 years to flood us with toxins. So we have to literally get the toxins out, and this is something the average person can do right at home to make themselves less resistant to the mind control, the psychological manipulation. We're all getting uh, drowned with the tsunami. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would tie back just to what Ryan said in, in the beginning, which is, uh, finding solutions for the injured because we have, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows someone that has been injured and, and it's, a, it's millions of people out there that need help right now. The other thing is media. I mean, I'm here with amazing colleagues from all over the world and, um, you know, they're underfunded and I always start saying, you know, by that we are the mainstream media. We are, we are becoming the mainstream media. We are coming up with the truth. So support media, independent media, and, um, you know, because these people are really doing an amazing job and risking a lot by speaking their truth, so just not forget about them. <laughs>
right before we stop for a break and in individual interviews, I just wanted to introduce the, the person who actually is the reason that we are all here, and that's Mr. Ivan Tinjik. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that we are all here on day three after making a very successful day two. Uh, I have been following um, our work and the work of our colleagues for a long time, but what we did yesterday and what we are doing today is a completely, a completely another level. And me and my colleagues, the MEPs, are uh, very happy, honored, and proud. And uh, today, after we finish this, I believe we have made history, but uh, a lot more is to come. Uh, what is the essence? And uh, a final remark, I should say here, is that uh, there is political will in Europe and there is political will in European Parliament and many national parliaments to make things right, to follow the scientific path, to follow the path of respect of human rights and freedoms. And um, everything that was said, we will present to the European Commission, we will present to European Medicines Agency, all the other agencies, and of course, uh, we will deliver to COVID committee, which is soon finishing its work, just a few more months, and there will be a final report. I don't expect them to accept too much, don't be too optimistic, uh, but if they don't accept it, we will repeat on and on and on, and we will hammer them with this data. And thank you very much for delivering everything, researching everything, presenting everything, and um, let's keep fighting until the final victory. Thank you. It seems to me where I live in the United States, the general public is more aware of the harms uh, that we have long COVID uh, vaccine injury uh, than physicians are. And we all know that we can treat these, these illnesses, but there are millions of people out there that are not getting treated. What can we do to make sure that physicians actually recognize this uh, and educate them that there are treatment and there are, there are cures for uh, these horrible illnesses. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, so my organization is completely focused on treating um, COVID in all its phases. And certainly right now, our main focus over the last year plus has been uh, really concentrating on this epidemic of vaccine injuries and, and long COVID syndromes. Um, they're, they're very similar. We have uh, really, I wouldn't say innumerable, but we've identified many, many different compounds and therapeutics which have efficacy. There's definitely no cure. This is an extremely complex disease for which we're really only starting to begin understanding, but certainly we're making a lot of progress. Uh, you know, a, another great sadness uh, in the response to COVID is really a lack of recognition of vaccine injury. It doesn't even exist, really. Uh, I mean, they'll talk about it in the individual patient, but not as a research target. Um, there was an article last week talking about the United States response to treatment and study of long COVID. That's acceptable. You can just blame everything on COVID, just ignore the vaccines. But So even that syndrome, if they want to call it long COVID, there's been $1.2 billion spent. And from what I understood from the article, there's about five trials that they are planning on doing in studying therapeutics. The only trial that is set up to enroll patients is studying a drug called Paxlovid, oddly. Shockingly, right? Uh, which is a ludicrous uh, pro proposal, but they haven't even uh, enrolled one patient. So the, the point is, you know, myself and my organization, as well as others, we really are collaborating with um, a, a number of clinicians who are expert at chronic diseases, we're continuously studying the sort of basic science immunologic literature to understand better the mechanisms. Um, and then in my practice and the practice of others, we are evolving by trialing different approaches. And, you know, we're using what I call good old gumshoe medicine, meaning observation, experience, insight, and you make the best judgment using a risk-benefit profile. And, um, you know, I haven't been publishing, I've been really talking about my experiences and I try to share with others what my personal approach is. Um, you know, if you go to flccc.net, we have what we call a protocol there. It probably shouldn't be called a protocol because there's way too many options and it's just not pragmatic to deploy all of them. 
Um, but we do have uh, some plans. I'm, I'm talking with uh, Children's Health Defense as well as other organizations, which is really trying to give more examples for how uh, different of us clinicians have approached the, the understanding and treatment. And I hope as we share our experiences and other doctors are more able to recognize it and more willing to treat, even though there are no guidelines or studies, right? You don't have the big randomized controlled trials, which for me is actually freeing because I don't have to be told what works and what doesn't work by some captured agency, right? I can tell them what works because I'm figuring it out. And so um, I, I'm very um, inspired by this work and uh, the patients really appreciate it and it can be very satisfying as, as well as ever humbling. So one of my other hats is as a medical advisor for the wellness company, which is a private interest as a small startup in free freedom medical care, uh, we offer low cost, person to person, face to face, Zoom based telemedicine. This has been growing exponentially since last October when we first went public. And we we're doing the same as, as Pierre uh, in basically letting doctors use their best judgment for any medications and methods that they choose to think beneficial for treating long COVID, vaccine injury, and, and so on. We are. We have some supplements that we're also trying. That basically is empirical, and and that's all we can do and, until we have evidence. But we are collecting the results and following patients and generating a body of, of data as to how well these things do or don't work and over what time frames. And so we are hoping that we're helping patients, but we don't really know yet and, until we see that patients are improving, which we have seen, actually, with some of these supplements that patients are improving. Whether they would have improved anyway, we don't know yet, but the, the supplements and the visits are relatively low cost, and, and so we think that we're at least fulfilling a, uh, an option for patients that they cannot get from their doctors in general and at a, at a low price point. Hippocrates Orgos is an organization that is focused on the COVID therapy, and we are almost on the same page of Phil CC. And we uh, open an observatory in Italy that collects uh, uh, a lot of injured patients. And fundamentally, we um, uh, thought uh, about the physiopathologies. It's uh, not easy to understand, but fundamentally, we uh, why spike uh, proteins injuries for give inflammatory problems. So we have to um, disin uh, disin uh, work on it. We also have to um, break the protein, the spike protein that is a toxin. So we have to neutralize it. And this is fundamental um, uh, tools uh, that, we, uh, that we use. And, uh, but every person is different because symptoms can be different. So therapy should be also tailorized, uh, suited on the patients. We use the uh, molecules that are common for everybody for inflammation and to crush the, to the, the protein, to neutralize the spike protein. But we also uh, have a different approach uh, that is related to different symptoms because we could have uh, neurological symptom or cardiac symptoms. And to this purpose, uh, for this purpose, uh, Hippocrates Org opened uh, in whole Italy uh, a lot of ambulatory that take care of, pas uh, of patients, and uh, the results uh, seems uh, seems good. But of course, there are situations that we can cure. As one example is SLA. Uh, but uh, the collaboration with other organizations give us uh, uh, and uh, confrontation uh, hope that will uh, progress very soon in the, the therapy of patients. I just wanted to add to that that yes, collaboration, educating doctors, awareness raising, our campaign is raising awareness where people tell their stories, but we also need to understand that we're heavily censored. Like, they are really shutting it down. Uh, we, we, um, you can't find the group on Facebook. So they're actually trying to hide these stories and, and um, Twitter has helped a lot now. But, but it's also about the awareness raising and, and people being able to actually speak out and, and um, be acknowledged out there. Another point, uh, again, smaller and again involving ivermectin, but um, 
You know, in the treatment of long haul and vaccine injury, for me, and I use many different therapies, for me, ivermectin is flat out the number one most effective. Now, does it cure or help everybody? No. I would say in my practice, maybe 30% of patients don't respond at all to ivermectin. But those that do, it can range from really robust transformative responses to more modest. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because you know, this war on ivermectin, which basically destroyed it, removed it from formularies of hospitals, has made it now, you know, physicians who use it have been persecuted, again, for treatment of COVID. Um, there is no data or trials because they're not doing them to show it doesn't work in long COVID. And those of us who treat this disease, we use it a lot. But there's an issue because there are entire countries in this, on this globe right now, people suffering with chronic illness and the doctors have their hands tied. They can't give them one of the safest, most widely available medicines to help relieve their symptoms. And so at the same time that I'm very confused, I'm also encouraged that Australia, where I have a number of patients that I treat there, yesterday, for whatever reason, has now removed their sort of restrictions on the use of, co uh, on the use of ivermectin. Now, they went further to say we don't endorse its use in treatment of COVID, so I don't know what they're about here, but they seem to be walking something back, and I think that's really good for Australians, and I want that same thing to happen in the other advanced economies around the world that have persecuted this drug, because there are, there, there are millions of injured uh, around the world, and that is a drug that could benefit them once more, and so I think it's still, ivermectin and the persecution of it is still going to be a very important issue.